In this half, we're going to be looking into the ethics and decision-making around organ donation. And uh, to help us through this uh, rather complicated area, uh, Dr. Bernadette Richards has worked at the University of Adelaide for a number of years and her research focuses in the area of tort law in general with a specific focus on medical law and ethics. Her current research focus sits at the nexus of the ethics and the law in the context of medical treatment with a particular emphasis on consent in medical treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Bernadette Richards. Okay, so let's start around the decision-making uh, around organ and tissue donation. What is the, the legal framework around which those decisions are made? Okay, it's, um, as you can imagine, the legal framework is, is relatively uh, complex. I mean, Australia is like a, an enormous squabbling family with a lot of siblings who can't agree. You know, New South Wales is never going to have the same law as Victoria because, you know, that's, that's just not acceptable. But um, in uh, the area of organ donation, we have um, a very rare state, uh, situation of uh, state cooperation and agreement with some subtle differences, mm. Um, mm. but we have a consistent set of uh, legislation. They're collectively referred to as the Human Tissue Acts. And uh, they cover all of the many, many aspects. And essentially, uh, the process is now in South Australia, as mentioned earlier by Sally, so long as there has been no clear um, refusal during life and next of kin uh, approve or agree, um, then um, organ donation can proceed. Um, in some of the other states, there is a requirement that there has to be um, written approval, uh, consent prior to death. And so that's why uh, a few years ago now, we, um, in, or we collectively, Australia, introduced the um, Organ Donation Registry, which gives the opportunity for people to register and to express their desire to donate their organs. Because the important thing is that whilst we're alive, we're autonomous, we have legally and ethically very, very strong um, support around us that we can choose absolutely what is or is not done with our bodies and we can express that desire that will be um, organ donors but then uh, once we die then things shift a little bit and as was touched upon in the, uh, the opening presentation um, there's an awful lot of respect as there ought to be around the grieving family and uh, so therefore it, it then becomes a conversation and uh, your desire if the family strongly disagrees, the organ donation will generally not proceed. Okay, let's just unpack that a bit. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as you just scribble on your driver's licence, tick the box, and no. it's all over and done with. No. Not at all. What no. else do you as an individual need to do to ensure that your organs will be donated should you die? Well, um, be put on the organ donor registry. Um, and then you can have your card, which says that you're an organ donor. So um, that's uh, that's a, a solid. Where do you go for that? Is there a website? There or is a website. Yeah. Yes, and I believe you get a, a letter on your 18th birthday. I heard, yes. or something like that. So um, when you tick the box on your license, then that becomes an intent, and that actually goes onto the register. It's managed by Medicare, and so you can go onto the Medicare website, um, or you can go onto the Donate Life website, which will take you through. And on that Medicare website, it is fantastic. I, I have a look every now and again, and uh, just to, it's very usable, very easy. And then you can register online. You will then get a letter, actually, at that time. And you have to consent with a signature. Then you're on consent. Mm -hmm. um, then on your, the other way around is when, as a 17-year-old, you might ticket on your licence. That's an intent. But at 18, you will get a letter from Medicare saying, do you wish to convert this to a consent on the register? Mm -hmm. and, so it's okay. highly, it's very well managed in Australia, I have to say. Okay, so you go to those lengths, but then your family can overrule that? Absolutely, because they're the uh, living, breathing, grieving people um, involved in the process. And, of course, um, all, all health carers, anyone in, in the team, you know, the family are also part of who they're looking after. Um, in that process 
And if there's evidence that it will cause deep distress, they won't proceed. So um, they, uh, and in fact, here in South Australia, in the law, it says if there is evidence of disagreement, then it's advised not to proceed. There is the designated officer who has the final say here in mm -hmm. South Australia, and I dare say a designated, I mean, I've never been a designated officer, Sally mm -hmm. has been, I dare say in the face of enormous family grief, uh, it wouldn't proceed, yeah, right. because that, that's really, mm -hmm. because a person would not want their family to, to be going through that. So of course, then that comes back to the fact that the, the best and most positive step that you can take is to have that, to tell your family. So you, you need to have that to family discussion Absolutely. well ahead of time so yeah. everybody mm -hmm. is, is clear. Yes. What about kids? Can kids, is, is there a, 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 an age limit below which kids can't make up their uh, own consent? Well, 16, they can um, be put on the register as an intent. Yeah. 18, that converts to the consent situation. Mm. Um, but then again, you know, I mean, I know I've had conversation with, with my son and he was once very cross at the, the grand old age of about 11 or 12 when he was, was disgusted when I think he'd seen it on a BTN or something. Yes. That, um, news, he yeah. said, so I can say, you can say no. And I said, yes, actually, <laughs> I do a lot. But um, <laughs> yes, to that as well, I can say no. But, I, you know. Oh, mum. Yeah. yeah. Well, what, what about the other way around? Can, um, uh, can parents consent to having their oh, child's absolutely. organs yes, donated. Yes, yes. so yeah. it, it's really, it is, it goes right through the family and it is that discussion and everybody can have their input, but um, mm. it, it really has to be had. The, it's interesting that question about family override because we get that question a lot. And so we went back and had a look in our, our files and looked through our data and we did a 10 year look back and we've had two um, disputes and two only two cases whereby families had overridden. Out and of so, how many cases? Um, well, that was over. Ten, so that's um, about three hundred. Mm. Okay. Mm. That, uh, actually, I'm mm. surprised that the mm. level of dispute is so low. Wouldn't yeah, it? and that is because I mean, it is very rare. It's interesting that the public seems to think that it happens a lot, but it doesn't. Mm. We only find the dispute when there's a, a very fractured family, for example or you know, relationships have de deteriorated within a family over many, many years. Um, but the key is that we know that if families know that their loved one wanted to be a donor, then almost about 98% of them will agree with that. So. And I think, um, and it's something that can't be underemphasised, is the role of those teams in the hospital. I mean, it's not like a Monty Python sketch where they bring out your dead or anything like that. These people are wonderful, aren't they? Absolutely. And they yeah. speak to the families and they nurture them and they help them and they support mm. them through that. And whilst there might be some initial concern or resistance, mm. I think mm. these, these, it's just such uh, um, a skilled group of people who uh, help with the counselling and the support that, uh, that, it, that it helps mm. facilitate through that decision-making mm. process. Mm. So if you have a situation where people might be wavering, um, as we've heard tonight, um, these are people who are often in profound shock because this morning they had a healthy loved one um, and now they're, they're faced with this enormous decision. Um, so if you ha but if you have a background of conversation and you combine that with this very skilled and team support. approach and mm. support within the hospital system, which is what we're very, very lucky to have here in this state and, and Australia-wide, I believe, mm. Mm. Um, then that's why. Mm. Well, maybe uh, time to bring back to our, our case study with uh, uh, around Alex. Mm -hmm. Can you, Karen, detail for us what that process of the councillors approaching you, how is that from the, the, the donor's mother's perspective? What, what did you experience? Um, am I talking about how we came to that decision yeah. now? Yeah. Um, uh, before we lost Alex, two years before we lost Alex, my mother had become very ill very quickly. Um, she was a fit, healthy, 63-year-old. Um, suddenly she became ill um, and her liver was failing. She was put uh, on the waiting list um, 
you know, which was a big shock to all of us as, mm. you know, fit, mm. healthy woman and suddenly she needed a new liver. Yeah. Um, mm. So to sort of sit and watch her deteriorate very, very, very quickly um, and, mm. you know, not know if, if an organ would come in time was very distressing to her, very distressing to, to us. Um, thankfully, we got the phone call six months later, which was quite a surreal experience to go through because you're relieved and ecstatic that um, a liver has, has arrived uh, or has become available. Um, but you know at the same time in another hospital bed, in another hospital somewhere, that some family is you know, traumatised and, and, and grieving. Um, but um, so her operation went ahead. It was very successful. The, the effects of the transplant were almost immediate, um, mm. quite surprising. I mean, we thought it would take her, you know, weeks and weeks to, to, get, to get stronger. It was, it was almost instant. Um, you know, we, we witnessed, obviously, the miracle of, of transplant surgery. Um, so obviously, obviously during that time that she was on the waiting list, that was a, a subject that was talked about a lot in mm. our in our family. Mm. Our kids were teenagers, I guess, um, at the time. So we we talked about it often, just over dinner. You know, um, would you be an organ donor if if mm. if you were in that situation? Um, all of the kids said yes, of course. Well, you know, why wouldn't you? Um, mm. Pete and I had always been organ donors anyway, but you know, this was suddenly it was sort of thrust upon us with your mum. With, with mum. Mm. Um, so, how do you think your experience with Alex would have been different if you hadn't gone through that previous experience? I don't, I don't know. I don't know that it, it would have, um, but because of the experience we'd been we'd been through, we knew that you know that. I mean, we never we never expected to be in that scenario, obviously. But then all of a sudden here we were, you know, Alex was 18 years of age and, you know, we were confronted with this situation. But we, but we knew that, that he would want to help other people and it was basically just the right thing to do. And uh, I'm trying to in, in, imagine myself in, in the hospital, mm. uh, in your situation. So was there a... Um, the the the, uh, the transplant counsellors mm -hmm. did they suddenly arrive at a particular <laughs> point or were um, they engaged like from before it was even I actually asked for them in our in our situation I I we knew that Alex was gone um, I mean they talk about about the brain death yes. Um, yeah. And obviously, you know, you don't give up hope until you get that final, that final confirmation. Mm. But, but we knew, we he knew, was so he, Ill. we we knew he was gone. It was, it was quite obvious to us. Um, so, you know, and it's a trend. It's actually um, the donor coordinators, not transplant yes. coordinators, that come in because the transplant okay, coordinators, yeah, sure. it's it's kept very separate mm. for, yeah. for ethical reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And so. It's the donor coordinator that comes in, and, mm. and, and that's but I'm part just of trying to figure out yep. whereabouts yeah. in the process the donor yep. coordinators actually mm. start to make contact. And okay, talk. The, it's that's the, the role of the intensive care doctor, mm. um, and and the intensive care team. They will call our 24-hour number and say we have just done the first set of brain death testing. Mm. It is likely that the second test will be positive. We're just letting you know, and then a call might come again to our donor coordinator. And says, yep, you need to come in. You know, we've had an initial uh, discussion with the family and so if the family has given verbal consent or indicated that they'd like to know more, mm. then they come in and, they, and our team meet with the family. So one donor coordinator is on call, goes in, we have backup and 